and welcome to our worship here in Yarra this morning. <clears throat> I brought the wrong glasses, so this could be interesting. I have the following intimations. Next week, which is the 27th of November, we're in Kirkup at 11.30 and the service will include Holy Communion. The following week is the 4th of December already and we're back here at 11.30. Today, we're announcing the return of our grand Christmas hamper raffle to raise money for church funds. Um, sheets of numbers will be available from next Sunday to buy or to sell. But please also, yeah, they be from Anne Blundell. Please also see her about contributing to the contents of the ham hamper this year. The draw will take place on the 18th of December at Kirkup. Advent discussion groups are starting on the 25th of November, either Friday mornings in Selkirk Church Hall or Sunday evenings at the Bethune's house. The details are on a notice at the back of the church. And finally, could you please all remain in your seats for a short while at the end of the service as I have an announcement to make. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Scott to lead us in our worship this morning. Thank you, Nora. Good morning, everyone. It was uh, looking lovely as we came along there. Uh, the, the sun was starting to come out and the lovely colours, and uh, so it was a lovely, pleasant drive from uh, Selkirk. So I hope it's the same on the way, on the way back. Um, our um, call to worship comes from Psalm 145. The Lord is righteous in all he does, merciful in all his acts. He is near to those who call to him with sincerity. He supplies the needs of those who honour him. He hears their cries and he saves them. We're going to sing together. The words will appear on the screen behind me. Um, the hymn is uh, 482. I'll just go over a few words. Come, come let us to the Lord our God. With contrite hearts return. Our God is gracious, nor will leave the desolate to mourn. And can I remind you to stay standing at the end of this service as the offering is brought forward. Shall we pray? Lord God, 
these are our gifts to you. You continue to bless us with many gifts. We look forward to celebrating that indescribable gift of your son Jesus at Christmas time. But receive these gifts from us with our thanks for all that you are and all that you continue to do for us. For we present them in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We come before the Lord in prayer, and the words of the Lord's prayer will appear uh, on my left here. Shall we pray? Lord God, it is good to be here in your presence. It is good to feel the sense of your Holy Spirit with us in our time of worship. Lord, you're an awesome and amazing God. We are here to praise you, not just on this day, your special day, but on every day of our lives. Lord, you're glorious and majestic. You're good and kind, compassionate and merciful and full of constant love. You are truly faithful to us, your people, your children. Lord, we praise you this day. May our worship songs ascend to you. May we realize that you are here with us as we worship, as we pray, as we listen together to your word. Father God, forgive us. Forgive us for the times that we have ignored you, ignored your word and the leading of your Holy Spirit within us. Lord, help us to learn from your son Jesus and his obedience to you. Help us to learn to forgive others, even though at times, Lord, we find that very hard. Help us to forgive those who have wronged us. Lord, help us to follow your ways all of our days, and not our own ways. Lord, there are some things that we just do not understand, but we do understand this, that you love us with that great and amazing love. Help us to put all our trust, all our hope, all our confidence in you. For you can always be depended upon. You will never, ever let us down. Lord, our God, how good it is to be here in your presence this day. How good it is to speak with you in our prayers, to listen to your words also as we pray, and hear us as we join together in the words which Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. We sing together again, we sing this one uh, twice. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us.
now we have a reading. It's from Psalm 34, uh, verses 1 to 10, and Gordon has recorded it for us. Our Old Testament reading this morning is taken from Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10, and from the King James Bible. This is said to be a psalm of David when he changed his behaviour before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want for any good thing. Amen. We're going to turn now to our prayers uh, for others, and particularly I want to pray for the uh, McLeod family following uh, Donald's death. There is a special service of thanksgiving uh, for his life. It's in our Leeson Church uh, this coming Thursday at 2 p.m. So we'll pray for Lucille and for all the family and for others. Shall we pray? Lord God, it is good to come close to you, to pray for those that we know very well, for others that we do not know at all. Lord God, we give thanks for, for Donald and for his life and for his service here to uh, the churches in this area. And Father God, we pray for Lucille, for Torquil, for Rona, and for Jeanette, and for all others who mourn. Be especially with them um, on Thursday as they remember a husband and a dad. Lord, bring them your comfort, your peace. Support them at this time and in the times to come. And Lord, we would pray for, for others who mourn at this time or for those who, at this time of year, it brings back memories of those that are no longer with us. Father God, we pray for those who are worried about the future, about heating, about finance, about all that is going on in our world. We pray for our leaders who have met at COP27 and at the G20. We pray for the decisions that have been made, that they would be decisions that could be implemented by our governments and not just words, that they may be put into action by those in authority. Lord God, there are many different things that we need to pray for. We look ahead to the wonderful season of Advent and Christmas Day itself in just a few weeks' time. We thank you for the wonder of Emmanuel, God with us. And we look forward to celebrating that time. No matter how many times we may have celebrated in the past, still a very, very special time for each one of us. Lord, bring to our minds now those that we should pray for, especially at this time of year, as we pray now in the silence. Lord 
God, how good it is to pray for others, to know that others are praying for us. Help us to continue to speak with you, to listen to all that you are saying to us. And we bring all our prayers in the strong and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and our Lord. I'm going to stay seated for this uh, next hymn. It's a lovely hymn that gets us ready to hear God's word. It's 599 or on the screen. Holy Spirit, hear us. Help us while we sing. Breathe into the music of the praise we bring. Holy Spirit, prompt us when we try to pray. Nearer come and teach us what we ought to say. We'll stay seated. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's only five weeks till Christmas. Five weeks today, we'll all, well, by this time we'll have opened lots of presents, I would think. <laughs> Depends if we've got young children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren or whatever uh, who are up very early. There'll be the usual um, lots of Christmas films, although we've got different things now like Netflix and um, Prime Video and all these kind of programs. Uh, there'll still be on terrestrial TV, the, the same sort of um, films, I suppose. We'll have a sound of music. Um, it's a wonderful life. All these things. The Great Escape. I'm going to think about the Great Escape today. Um, and I think one of these days when I watch it, I think Steve McQueen's going to go over that that fence and he's going to walk the bike, and that will make the film even better. Um, but we're going to read about a Great Escape that happened a long time ago. It's in Acts chapter 12, and reading from verse 1. Uh, in my Good News Bible, it's page 163. We're reading Acts chapter 12, page 163, and reading the first 19 verses of the story of this great escape. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. About this time, King Herod began to persecute some members of the church. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he went on to arrest Peter. This happened at the time of the festival of unleavened bread. After his arrest, Peter was put in jail when he was handed over to be guarded by four groups of four soldiers each. 
Herod planned to put him on trial in public after the Passover feast. So Peter was kept in the jail, but the people of the church were praying earnestly to God for him. The night before Herod was going to bring him out to the people, Peter was sleeping between the two guards. He was tied with two chains, and there were guards on duty at the prison gate. Suddenly an angel of the Lord stood there, and the light shone in the cell. The angel shook Peter by the shoulder, woke him up, and said, Hurry, get up. At once the chains fell off Peter's hands. Then the angel said, Fasten your belt, put on your sandals. Peter did so, and the angel said, Put your cloak round you and come with me. Peter followed him out of the prison, not knowing, however, if what the angel was doing was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed by the first guard post, then the second, and came at last to the iron gate leading into the city. The gate opened for them by itself, and they went out. They walked down the street, and suddenly the angel left Peter. Then Peter realized what had happened and said, Now I know that this is really true. The Lord sent his angel to rescue me from Herod's power and from everything the Jewish people expected to happen. Aware of his situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outside door. Sound effects today. Peter knocked at the outside door and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer it. She recognized Peter's voice and was so happy that she ran back in without opening the door and announced that Peter was standing outside. You're mad, they told her, but but she insisted that it was true. So they answered, it must be his angel. Meanwhile, Peter kept on knocking. At last, they opened the door and when they saw him, they were amazed. He motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and he explained to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell this to James and the rest of the believers, he said. Then he left and went somewhere else. When morning came, there was a tremendous confusion among the guards. What had happened to Peter? Herod gave orders to search for him, but they couldn't find him. So he had the guards questioned and ordered them to be put to death. After this, Herod left Judea and spent some time in Caesarea. Amen. May God add his blessing to those readings from his holy word. To his name be all the glory and the praise. So, the story about Herod. This was Herod Agrippa I. A bit confusing, all the, the different Herods, a bit like the Henrys or the Louis from France. There was quite a lot of them. This Herod Agrippa was the grandson of Herod who was uh, the one that features in the Christmas story with the wise men and Jesus. This Herod was a friend of the Roman Emperor Caligula. Now Herod decided to get rid of some of these troublesome Christians. He'd arrested James. There were two Jameses. The one later on that's mentioned is the brother, uh, the actual brother of Jesus. But this James was the brother of John, one of the, the fishermen and disciples. James was executed. This pleased the Jewish leaders, so Herod then went on and arrested Jesus, uh, arrested Peter. It was Passover time, so no executions could take place during the Passover. Herod had to wait. He was taking no chances with uh, Peter. He had him guarded by four groups of four soldiers, two on either side of him chained up to him, and two at the cell door. Meanwhile, the believers were earnestly and fervently play- praying for Peter. And that's the bit we want to concentrate on today. They were earnestly and fervently praying for Peter. The night before Peter was due to be executed, their prayers were answered. This is how the great escape happened. Peter's asleep. He's chained between the two guards. Suddenly a bright light shines in the darkness, lights up the whole uh, cell. An angel shakes Peter and says, wake up. The chains fall off his wrists, he gets dressed, the angel asks him to follow him and Peter does, although he's in a bit of a daze and thinks he may be all be dreaming. The first gate, they go through, no guards. Second gate, which was guarded as well, no guards there. Final outer gate open of its own accord and Peter found himself out in the street. 
He looked around and the angel was gone. He pinched himself just to check that it wasn't a dream, but it was real. He had been freed. He had been set free by God, sending his angel. A miracle, a great miracle had taken place. Peter decided to go to Mary's house. The believers were there praying earnestly for him uh, not to be killed and to be released. Now Mary was John Mark's uh, mother, John Mark, Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. He knocks on the door, he waits, the servant girl called Rhoda um, comes along to the door. She recognises Peter's voice when he says, uh, can you let me in please? Um, but she doesn't let him in, she doesn't open the door, she rushes back to tell everyone that Peter is outside. It's him, she says, Peter's at the door, he's been released. The believer said, don't be daft, Rhoda, we're praying for Peter. Remember, he's in prison, that's why we're meeting here, and that's why we're praying. But Rhoda keeps on insisting, no, he really is there. Meanwhile, Peter's still outside the door, knocking to get in. And Peter must have been thinking, it's easier to get out of prison than it is to get into my friend's house. This is ridiculous. But eventually the believers believe Rhoda, the servant girl, and they let Peter in. Peter explains all about his great escape. He says, tell Jesus' brother James, who back to him had been sort of the leader of the, the group, um, and all the others, and then he leaves them and goes somewhere else. Next day there's uproar in the prison. Um, what's has happened to Peter? He's just not there. The guards couldn't explain it. Herod was livid. He gave orders for the guards to be executed themselves. Um, and then he'd had enough of these Christians and Jerusalem. And so he moves north to his palace in Caesarea. What are we to make of all of this? What does this story of the great escape tell us today about praying in particular? It tells us three things. It says they prayed earnestly, they prayed specifically, and they prayed together. Earnestly, specifically, together. They prayed earnestly. The Bible says the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and wonderful results. The situation was desperate. James had been executed. Peter faced the same fate. What would they do? What could they do? The only thing they could do was to gather together and pray. They prayed earnestly, just as Jesus himself prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Fervent prayer, continuous prayer. It needed to be because Peter's death was imminent when the Passover was over. Ajith Fernando is a um, Christian pastor from Sri Lanka, and he's written these words. He says, through earnest prayer, we can influence the course of history. For God powerfully answers such prayers. Earnest prayer, wholehearted, urgent, pleading with God to do something. How earnest are our prayers, our prayers for others. Do we keep on praying until we get an answer? Or do we sometimes get discouraged after a wee while, when no answer seems to come and we just give up? How much effort do we put into praying for others and their situations? Let's say you're, you're driving your car along the, the road when you hear an ambulance siren behind you. What do you do? Well, you make every effort to get out of the way of that ambulance because you know that inside it may be a question or a matter of life and death for the person in that ambulance. And so every effort, we make every effort to get out of the way. How much effort do we make when we're praying for other people? It may be life or death. It may be they face a big operation. It may be that they are seriously ill. Or it may be that we're praying for someone to know Christ as Saviour and Lord. And it's a matter of spiritual life or death. We must make every effort to pray for others. We must pray like the believers did, earnestly. Not just a few words now and then, well that can be uh, useful as well. But fervent, intense, ardent, heartfelt prayer. Devout, persistent, sincere. Remember when Jesus prayed in the garden? He sweated great drops of blood. We need to put our whole selves, body, mind and spirit into praying for others. 
we prayed earnestly. Secondly, the believers in Mary's home prayed specifically. They prayed specifically for Peter. They prayed for his safety. They prayed that he would not be executed. They prayed for his release. Perhaps their prayers went a bit like this. Lord, please rescue Peter from prison. Please help him. Don't let him die. Let him live. We implore you, Lord. We beg you, save him from death and bring Peter back to us. Jesus talks about praying specifically. He said there was once a man who went to a friend and he asks the friend for three loaves of bread. How specific is that? Not just for help, not just for food, but for three loaves of bread for him and his family. That's how you should pray, said Jesus. Pray specifically. Ask for specific things. Pray for specific people by name. We must name names as we pray quietly and with others. We must mention the needs to God. Even though he knows them himself, we must mention those needs before him. We must ask him to meet those needs. We must ask him to heal that person's illness, to take away the thing that people are worrying about, to keep them calm in the situation that they're about to face. We must pray to guide the surgeon who operates on someone, to restore the relationship with that friend or family that needs, that has been broken down, to take away that pain which is troubling someone, to ease the feelings of depression of someone else, to comfort the friend who mourns, and so on. P.T. Forsyth, a Scottish theologian, wrote a book called The Soul of Prayer. And he talks about how prayer works, how prayer changes things. And he tells us that there's a sense in which God's will is changed in answer to our prayers. His will is changed in answer to our prayers. And he reminds us of the story of Moses. And he says, Moses prayed intensely for his people, and fasted for 40 days and nights, went without food for all that time to concentrate his effort so he could focus his prayers on the people. Remember that the people had disobeyed the Lord their God. They'd uh, fashioned the golden calf and they started to worship that instead of worshiping the Lord their God. Moses, meanwhile, was up the mountain, Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord God. As a result of Moses' fervent prayer and his fasting, the Bible says, God relented and did not bring upon his people the disaster that he had threatened. And there are several other instances in the Bible of prayer changing God's mind. Paul says that through our prayers, we can alter the course of history. Prayer is powerful, not in itself, but it's powerful because we pray to the powerful one to the one who is all-powerful, almighty, all-seeing, all-knowing, who is able to help us, and he is infinitely more than able to do so. He's the one to go to with our specific requests, specific concerns. Let's go to him. Let's be specific when we pray. The believers prayed earnestly. They prayed specifically. And lastly, they prayed together. The text says they were united in prayer for Peter. It also says that many people had gathered and were praying. The Bible tells us that there's a place for our private and individual prayers each day. But it also tells us that there's a place for corporate prayer, for praying together as a family, as friends, as a small group, and as a church. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, says Jesus. But there seems to be an unexplainable sort of special power when we gather together to pray about matters on which we agree as Christians. Perhaps we could compare it to a petition to our government or to the council. The more signatures the petition has, the more the council or the government take notice of it and are more likely to act Upon what we're asking them to do. Perhaps that's the case with God. Although he hears all our individual prayers, all our individual petitions, somehow 
takes more notice and is more likely to act when a number of his people are united in prayer for the same thing. It's good to pray. It's good to pray on our own. It's good to pray in small groups. It's good to pray as a church family. They prayed earnestly. They prayed specifically. They prayed together. They prayed that Peter would be rescued from prison and saved from death. And as we know, that's exactly what happened. But when it did happen, we notice they didn't really believe it. Peter's at the door, said Rhoda. Don't be silly. Peter can't be at the door. We're praying for him. Peter's in prison. That's why we're here. They didn't seem to believe that God had answered their prayer. How could Peter possibly be there? They needed to have more faith. They need to realize that God answers our prayers. Sometimes he gives us exactly what we ask him for, as he did in this case. We can sometimes be the same. Sometimes we can have difficulty in believing that God will give us what we are asking him for. But we shouldn't be, because our God is so amazing. Our God can do wonderful things. As Gabriel said to Mary, there is nothing, nothing that God cannot do. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There is nothing that he cannot do. And Mary held on to that, to those words, and so must we. There is nothing that our God cannot do. He can do all things. We need to have faith. Jesus says we just need to have a little amount of faith, as small sometimes as a mustard seed. We don't need to have a great faith. We have to have a simple faith, but in a great God. Let's look a bit closer at this story. Let's look at the beginning of this passage in the first couple of verses. About this time, King Herod began to persecute some members of the church. He had James put to death by the sword. So Peter was rescued, safe from death, but James was killed. Now we should imagine that the believers were praying for their fellow Christians who were persecuted. We should assume that they were praying earnestly and specifically for James. But James was executed. The believers continued to be persecuted. Why was this? even though they were praying in the same way. What happened? Some years ago in Aberdeen, where I was ministering, a friend of ours, a minister in the next parish, was seriously ill. As a church, we decided to pray for him, to pray that he would be healed. We decided not just to pray on our own, although we would do that, not just in church on a Sunday, though we did that also, but to meet together as a church, or in the church, every night at particular time to pray for this particular person and so together we prayed earnestly we prayed specifically for our friend we prayed that he would be healed and our friend died why did that happen why did God not heal him he was faithfully preaching the gospel in his parish and reaching out to those who needed help we couldn't understand it and some of us, for some of us, it shook our faith. Why does God heal some and not others? And the answer came, well, we just don't know these things. But it also came to us that there is one thing that we do know, and we know this for certain, and that is that God loves us. Our God loves us. How do we know this? Because it tells us so in his word. The verse I quoted uh, last Sunday in Selkirk, John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone, everyone who believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. And also in the first letter of John in chapter 4, John writes, this is how we know that God loves us. He sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God loves us, and he proved it by sending his most prized possession, Jesus, his only son. 
And so when we look at the times when God does not save someone, as was the case with James, or when God does not heal someone, as was that case up in Aberdeen, or when God does not seem to be answering the prayers that we have prayed for many, many years for members of our family and friends and others, even though we don't understand why, even though we begin to doubt and it shakes our face, even though we find it hard, we need to hold on to the indisputable truth that God loves us. George Matheson was a Church of Scotland minister of a bygone era and wrote many wonderful hymns. He writes of how he came to write one of these hymns. He says, My hymn was composed as I sat alone in the manse of an Ellen on the evening of the 6th of June, 1882. It was the day, he says, of my sister's wedding. The rest of the family were staying overnight in Glasgow. His sister had looked after him for the past 20 years since he had gone blind at around the age of 20, and now she had left to be married. And George Matheson writes, Something happened to me which was only known to myself and which caused the most severe mental suffering. And this hymn resulted from my pain. He said it was the quickest bit of work that I ever did. I had the distinct impression of having it dictated to me by some inward voice. That hymn was called, O love that wilt not let me go. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and find the promise is not vain that morn shall tearless be. George Matheson came to see that despite all that had happened to him, God loved him and would never let him go. And we must do the same. We need to remind ourselves that despite all that may be going on around us, despite some being healed or rescued while others are not, despite our prayers for others seeming to be unanswered, God, our Father, loves us and always will. And so we need to go on praying. Praying earnestly, praying specifically, praying together. Praying to our Father who loves us with an everlasting love and who will never, ever let us go. Shall we pray? Lord, in this week which is ahead, please bring to our minds those people that we should pray specifically for. Pray on our own or pray with others. Pray for their needs as they face difficult situations in their lives. Lord, we thank you that you acted upon this earnest prayer of the believers all those years ago when Peter was released to do great and amazing work. And Lord, we don't understand why some people are, are helped and rescued and healed while others are not. But we do understand that great love that you have for us, that you will never, ever, ever let us go. May we hold on to that. May we focus on that now in the silence. Lord God, thank you for this time in your presence. And as we continue to worship you, thank you for that love that showed itself by sending your son Jesus to live amongst us, to die for us, to be raised to life. Thank you that you love us and all is well. And hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing together um, our final hymn, 547, or on the screen, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. An announcement to make about the Presbytery Mission Plan, which was published on the 10th of November. Throughout the Church of Scotland, total numbers of people attending services have dropped considerably over many years. This has been made worse by the COVID lockdown as folk got out of the habit of attending church each Sunday. And all this means that our income the money that you donate to us in the collection plate or direct via your bank is also considerably reduced. This money is used for paying the minister, keeping the lights and heating on and maintaining the buildings amongst other things. This situation repeated around the country means that the Church of Scotland would be expecting to face bankruptcy if nothing is done. The general perception, I think, is that the church is a rich organisation and I'm afraid that is no longer the case. This has forced them into a very tough plan to cut back on costs and therefore buildings. 
An assessment was carried out in this presbytery this year and many others. And presbytery have just approved the plan for our area. You may indeed have already heard of closures of church buildings in the borders and elsewhere because people are making a huge fuss about it. So I'm afraid now it's our turn. The proposal by Presbytery for Ettrick and Yarrow Parish is to lose two of its church buildings. They've suggested that we keep Kirkup in Ettrick Bridge and that Yarrow and Ettrick should close within five years. And I know this will be a shock to people, so I'll just repeat it, that we face the loss of Yarrow Church, this building, and Ettrick within five years. So not tomorrow, but still. Their ideas that worship would then hopefully move to village halls, etc. Ashkirk's church will also be lost, but Selkirk will be safe. The Kirk Session elders have been discussing this because we've known for two or three weeks. Um, and we've not agreed to the plan, and I think we're actually supposed to, um, you know, that it has, it has to be approved by the Kirk Session. Um, our, fin our own finances are fragile, and in all honesty, we can't afford three buildings. However, we do think we've got a bit of wriggle room um, over exactly what churches close and how many. Uh, in future weeks, we'll be consulting you. We're going to give you people time to think about it. We're going to be consulting the congregation and the local communities to get your views and ideas of, of how we see our own future and what we might do. We've all been in shock about this and hope for your support as we struggle to find a way forward for Ettrick and Yarrow. Nothing's going to happen very quickly. Now just keep that in your minds. So we are going to keep going as things are for the time being. A longer document will be sent out by me within the next few days, hopefully today or tomorrow, to explain the background of all of this and possible options for what we might try to do. There'll be a printed form of this available uh, next, from next Sunday. And if there's a need, we will also hold congregational meetings. And I'll just add finally that uh, Scott's sermon was very apt, I think, that uh, prayers can be very powerful. And please remember us and our churches in your prayers. Thank you.